Welcome to our live broadcast from the Mountain of God Tabernacle, high atop Mount Eagle Mountain, Tennessee. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and I'd like to tell you that we are a five-fold full gospel interdenominational church which offers contemporary praise and worship, the teaching of God's Word, healing, deliverance, prophetic ministry, and much more. We are located in beautiful downtown Mount Eagle, Tennessee at 331 King Street. That's at the corner of King and Fourth. Our Sunday morning worship service starts at 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, and everyone is welcome. Now, if for some reason you cannot attend our sanctuary, be sure to join our live stream at wildfireonthemountain.com. That physical address again is 331 King Street, or you can watch us live at www.wildfireonthemountain.com. Anybody need any special prayer? There's an anointing, and I don't like to waste the anointing. All right, you can pray with me in agreement. We've been working on the vinyl siding, and we had someone get hurt. They fell off the ladder. A saw cut their finger, and uh, they didn't have to go to the hospital or anything, but. Let's just uh, lift up uh, Brother Jerry here. Father, just ask that you just repair any damage that might have happened by him falling off the ladder. Yeah, Father. Muscles that are kind of pulled and bruises and anything, Father, that needs repair. Because he's uh, helping us put vinyl siding on this ha- your house, Lord. He's doing it for you, Lord. So we ask that you lift him up and that today he everything will be fine with nothing broken. Just give him a speedily recovery. In Jesus' name. Okay. Uh, I want to just say good morning to those that may watch this DVD. And I want to welcome you. This is the Mountain of God Tabernacle. We're in uh, Mont Eagle, Tennessee, 331 King Street, King and Fourth, corner of King and Fourth in uh, Mont Eagle, Tennessee. And we're going to be using this handheld mic. And uh, the Lord spoke to me this morning, and he said, uh, I do a share. And uh, what is it, 1 Corinthians 14? Let me see, make sure I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it says, how how be it, 1426, 1 Corinthians 1426. So this is a, um, um, a a share. This is kind of what we do in the cell a lot. It says, uh, verse 26, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm? How many of y'all got your Bibles with you this morning? Guess what? You got a psalm. <laughs> you got a lot of them. I think about 150 of them, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, every one of you has a song. You have a doctrine. How many of y'all know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Guess what? You got a doctrine. It's called the eternal doctrine of Christ. He says, you have a tongue. How many of y'all uh, have your uh, baptism in the Holy Ghost? Yeah, see, you're well equipped. Now, if you have a revel- if revelation, now you may, it doesn't say you have to have all these at one time, but a revelation is uh, pretty much something new might have happened in your life. You might want to share that. Oh, uh, you got an in- interpretation, you know. Uh, we do uh, have a couple people here that would have that gift if we needed it. Uh, but that's when a, a, a tongue flows out to the congregation, and then God raises up someone to interpret it. And then it says, let all things be done unto edifying. That means do it for your fellow Christians. Do it for your brothers and sisters. In other words, they sh- if you're preaching the Bible, you're doing it for them anyway. You know? So that's what we're going to do. And I'll probably save Brother Carl to, for last so that none of y'all would be, have to follow that act. I mean, you can follow me. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm just going to go. I'm going to do a little talking here, and then I'm going to turn it over to whoever has something else to share. And um, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to give you a couple uh, parts of a couple chapters that are very important chapters for uh, apostles and apostolic people. Because if you're, if you're an apostle, then you've got to make yourself open to these things that I'm going to show you. And some of y'all have heard me preach this before in other messages. Um, 
Ephesians chapter 3, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus, so therefore he's speaking to us. We're part of that church as well. Uh, we're the church in Mont Eagle, by the way. Let me explain something else to you. Denominationalism was really a work of the devil. I'm sorry. It was because it was de- it's, it's a divide and conquer sensu- situation. You look in the Bible, and there's no uh, Baptist other than John the Baptist. And he was spirit-filled, by the way, since birth. So, <laughs> so there's your spirit-filled Baptist, if you will. You know what I'm saying with that. But, you know, you don't see Episcopalians and Catholics and whatever. No, you see the church at Ephesus, the church in Corinth, the church in Rome. See, we're the church in Mont Eagle. And the church in Mont Eagle is supposed to be everybody working together. But because of denominational walls, everybody can't work together. Why? Because this, these people over here got this doctrine that water saves, which is not, uh, not true. Well, this one over here has this doctrine of the finished work. Jesus did it all so you don't have to do anything. That's not true. Why do you give us power? I give unto you power over uh, serpents and scorpions and, and, and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. Now, why would he give us power if we don't have to do anything? See, I mean, it's, it's almost ridiculous. It's, it's like almost laughable. Like, read your Bible. I mean, you know, you should come up with the right answer if you really read it, but most people don't. They rely on their church doctrine or their pastor or whatever, and they go through life Living a lie, really, I mean, somewhat. And then you got once saved, always saved. Well, I don't think that's true, because I can show you scriptures where people just rejected God. Once saved, always saved, you know. King Saul being one, you know. God picked him, and he went against God. Difference in him and David was he is David repented of his sins. Saul didn't. So I'm not so sure you'll see King Saul in the eternal. You will see David, no doubt about it. So all these little nitpicky things that are really not even scriptural, they're just church doctrine, is what uh, causes the church not to be the church in Mont Eagle, the church in Manchester, the church in wherever, Winchester, Chattanooga. See, that's, so you can see right here how the devil uh, decided to do that. Because when you look at the church in Ephesus, you're looking at everybody who is a Christian or wants to be a Christian coming to this one great big organization headed up by fivefold ministers, not one person, fivefold ministry. And, and they probably had dozens of pastors and dozens of apostles and dozens of, of if not more than that, uh, prophets and prophetesses. So the church is all out of order. And I'm not naive enough to think... You know, this, this message is going to put the church in order. I mean, you know, uh, God's going to come anyway. That's the way it works, whether it's in order or not. But he is coming for the bride without spot or wrinkle. Therefore, he's coming for the true church. He's coming for the remnant. And it's important that you be a part of the remnant that he's coming for. Well, how do you know you're a part of that? Read your Bible. Study it. Throw away all this church junk that it's not in the Bible. Find out when it was created. You know, I mean, like the Catholic Church created so much stuff for uh, what? Uh, they're still creating some of it for 2,000 years, or 1,700 years at least. I mean, you know, and it's stuff people do not know is not, does not line up with Jesus' word, doesn't line up with the Bible, doesn't line up with God's word. So there, if it doesn't line up with God's word, whose word does it line up with? The kingdom of darkness. That's simple. Look at verse 1. He says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 1. The prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know what he means? If you're going to be an apostle and you're really going to work for the Lord, you're a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Not a prisoner in the way that you're going to be treated badly, but a prisoner in the way that you have his life. You carry his ministry. More than your own, actually. And that's hard to do. I heard Pat Robertson the other day say that there's... He gave this figure of like 90% or something of pastors are all quitting and going on to other jobs and stuff just because their wives are getting burned out. And I mean, it was a high, it might have been 70%, but it was high. I was shocked, you know. Because to be married to a pastor who's a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that's a hard thing to do in our society. Because our society says, no, you can't do that. You need to be doing this, you know. Everybody watching television is rich, you know. 
It's what you need to be doing. Just look out for number one. It doesn't work. That's not biblical. Then it says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, he's talking about the dispensation of apostolic grace that was given to him to teach them, as he's teaching us when we read his word. Apostolic grace. That's what he's talking about. How that by revelation. Okay, Lord, Lord, stop me. Apostolic grace means apostles have the right to do things that other people wouldn't even think to do, dare to do, but... That's through grace, which is power, they'll do them. Uh, and Apostle Paul's a good example. How that by revelation, that means by the prophetic, him showing him what he's talking about, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. Now, the mystery he's talking about is the uh, Abrahamic covenant, uh, the Gentiles coming into the Abrahamic covenant of Christ is really what it is. He's talking about like uh, Ro- uh, was Romans chapter 11 where we're talking about being grafted in. That's what he's talking about. That was a mystery for him in his day. Wherefore, when you read it, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, he's saying <clears throat> once you read this, once you uh, uh, see it, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Now, the problem we have in the church today is we don't have enough apostles to receive the mysteries, and the ones that do receive the mysteries, half the people have been so indoctrinated in the different denominational uh, structures, they can't understand what the apostle's saying. And it's hard, believe me. Been up here trying to do it for years. You know, I've been telling for years, I've been telling churches, you need to have a deliverance ministry. You need to deal with the devil that way. And, you know, I don't know any very, some of them listen, a few. But, you know, they'll answer to God for that. Then it says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, which it is now. Now means like at present tense, present time now, like today, uh, October what, uh, 15th? Today, now. As it is now revealed unto who? His pastors and assistant pastors and not even his bishops. It says to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What he's saying is that the uh, there's things God reveals to apostles, holy apostles and prophets through the Holy Spirit that he didn't reveal to a previous generation. So in other words, my mother's generation didn't know the things that's been revealed to us. We don't know the uh, things that's going to be revealed to the next generation, if there is one. So what he's saying is that only apostles receive these mysteries. Then he goes on to say uh, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. See, that's his mystery for his day. Our mystery for our day is you need a deliverance ministry. I mean, you know, you need a prophetic ministry. A lot of other things. Quit playing church and be the church. Mm. Seven, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. That's apostolic grace was a gift given unto me by the effectual workings of his power. He's talking about apostolic power, apostolic grace. It was given to him. See, when I became an apostle, when Brother Carl became an apostle, it's given to us. Now, we didn't have to accept it. And probably if we knew all that we'd go through, if we did accept it, we probably wouldn't have accepted it. But it was given to us. We didn't go out and work. So, oh, I'm going to work hard so I can be an apostle. I didn't even know what the word meant when he called me into the office of apostle. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. He, you know, he's the, uh, he's the chief sinner. And yet he was made an apostle and given this apostolic grace. This is a revelation to him. I mean, this is a personal revelation to him. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The fellowship of the mystery. Ephesians, I think, chapter uh, 1. Uh, um, yeah, chapter 1. It talks about, uh, no, it's right here in this chapter 2. It talks about the one new man. That's what he's talking about. He had just gotten through talking about that in the previous chapter, chapter 2. Which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. What he's saying is before the world was even formed, Ephesians 2.15 was already in the works. 
God had spoken it, it would come to pass. That's the one new man. That's the remnant he's coming for. Then he goes on, watch this. To the intent that now, that's like today, his present day he's talking about. You can read that and it still means present day, our day. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, that's the kingdom of darkness. That's Lucifer's kingdom. That's uh, the devil's kingdom. He says, might be known by the church. Might be known by who? By the church. The manifold wisdoms of God. That manifold word means many. The many wisdoms of God. See, the church is called to uh, make the principalities and powers, that's the kingdom of darkness, know these mysteries and these many or manifold wisdoms of God. What's the wisdoms of God? All right. You need a deliverance ministry. (laughs) That's the wisdoms of God. You need prophetic ministry. That's the wisdoms of God. Why? Because through prophetic prophetic ministry, God can give you the gifts, gifts of wisdom and so forth. That's the wisdom of God. See, the church today mostly does not have the wisdom of God. They got the wisdom of the hierarchy of the church. That's a shame. That's sad. Because your priest or whoever's above you is not your judge. Jesus is your judge, and he's going to judge you. That's the wisdom you need. I mean, I don't understand why people can't just read this and get this, but they don't. Then it says, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, let's, for time's sake, let's look over at, um, where are we at here? Yeah, chapter, wait a minute. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. It's a page for me. Now, you're going to have time to share. Don't worry. I'm, down, I'm, 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 I'm over the hump here with me. I'm just trying to get it across that the Bible is much deeper than a salvation prayer and you're saved for life. It's much deeper. God doesn't save you for the fact that you're just being saved only. He saves you so you'll serve his kingdom. He's collecting subjects for his kingdom. That's what he's doing. And he wants more subjects for his kingdom. And when he saves you, he's expecting you to go get these subjects for his kingdom from the world. All right, let me look at uh, verse 7 here. Ephesians 4, 7, I believe I'm in. Let me see. Let me see it here again. Where are we at here? There's 4. Okay. Yeah, seven. But uh, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. Everyone has a measure of grace. You know what that word grace means? Power. Everyone has a measure of power. You know what that measure is? So you'll get saved. And then, so you'll go on and get more power, apostolic power, preferably, like Paul did, and work for his kingdom. So everyone has it. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, this is Jesus, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. In other words, the world was in captivity of Satan, and he took that and put it in captivity. How did he do that? He went to hell. We'll see that. That's what it's talking about, descended. He went to hell, took the keys to hell and death. Then in verse uh, Nine, now that he, that be Jesus, ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? The church today doesn't even know Jesus went to hell before he went to heaven. Ah, think how, see how serious this is? They think, oh, he just rose and went right up. No, he didn't go right up there because uh, even uh, he told some of um, one of the Marys, Mary Magnuson or someone, or don't touch me because I haven't even ascended to the Father yet. Don't touch me because I've, all I've done is gone to hell for three days or three nights or whatever. Now I'm going to ascend, but don't touch me till I ascend. I don't need to be uh, defiled with uh, uh, this human weakness, this fallen state. So he goes down to hell and he preaches to all the saints. And then he releases them. They were in prison. He takes the keys from, from Satan, keys of hell and death, and then leaves with all the saints. And now... Uh, Puts that in captivity. Now, the prison's in his captivity. So if you're a true believer, 
You're not going to be in captivity. Then it says in 9, uh, excuse me, 10. Well, let me share something with you. Just the Holy Spirit's given me this. Jesus went down there, took the keys to death and hell from Satan. Satan is no longer the ruler. But let me tell you, he thinks he is. <laughs> I don't understand how he thinks. We were uh, doing deliverance not too long ago with someone, and this person kept telling the deliverance team, Lucifer's stronger than Jesus. Lu kept telling me, personally, this demon didn't like me, personally that I had no power. I couldn't do nothing. He was more powerful than me. And I tell him, well, now, you know, you may be think you're more powerful than me, but I have Jesus, and I know you're not more powerful than him. Then he says, and wrote it out. <laughs> I mean, wrote it out. Lucifer is stronger than Jesus. I mean, when you see the writing, if you see it, it looks like something you see in Halloween, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, in that gothic-looking script, you know. And that was a big demon. And he was trying to convince me that Lucifer is stronger than Jesus. And I'm sitting there laughing at him. And I'm calling him. I'm saying, you're nothing, man. I even told him he's paralyzed. He couldn't move. You're paralyzed. And he, you know, because he, he wanted to jump and strangle me by then, you know. You're paralyzed. Y'all see, you see how you can make kind of a humorous story out of something that's serious? Because you have to laugh about these things. If you don't, the devil will use that, and he'll drive you bonkers. So this spirit is sitting there like this trying to do nothing. He couldn't do nothing, and he's glaring at me, and he'd look over at me, and I'd get right in his face and tell him, no, nah, you're, you're getting ready to go, and I can tell when they're starting the route out and they get fearful. So he, he didn't want to hear that anymore. So he looks over here at one of the other <laughs> deliverance ministers, and they weren't at all, you know, scared of him. They just said, well, you're nothing but a demon, you know. But I ran around the person and got between them, and I said, you ain't going to qu quit talking to me. You ain't going to run from me. And then he looks back this way, and I said, guess what? I'm back, and I'm back with the power of Jesus. I mean, it sounds like funny now, but I was laughing at him. And I'm, But when he writes, Lucifer is stronger than Jesus, all you got to do is remind him, and we did. Jesus took the keys to death and hell. Lucifer's a fallen being. The enemies, you, in other words, I kind of talked to him in language that, I'll tell you honestly, I was having a little bit of fun with him. You know, I was. And so is the other minister. Because I'm all this, say, I'm, I'm looking him in the face, and boy, he's glaring at me, and he's trying to, and he can't move, he's paralyzed. And I kept saying, you're nothing. I mean, I called him all kinds. I tried to be biblical. I could say, you're, you know, I remember saying, man, you ain't much more than dung. Big, big, as long as I use biblical words, you know. And I was like, because I was trying to figure out, man, are you this stupid? I mean, finally, he came out. But he, he starts trembling. And, of course, we're reading Scripture to him. One of the Scriptures is, even the demons believe and tremble. And I said, you believe it. You know it. You're just lying to me. Or somebody's lying to you. Because I, had, I was trying to figure out, does this demon really believe Lucifer's stronger than Jesus? Come on. Who's setting up there at the right hand of the Father? It's not Lucifer. You see? So this is nonsense. I mean, this spirit thought I was going to give... It, place to that and believe that and quit. That's what they want. And I remind them, I'm an apostle. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, pretty much. That's what I told them. I ain't quitting. And you know what? The deliverance team wasn't going to quit either. And guess what? He left. And we, uh, a week later, we kicked out his big brother. <laughs> pretty much the same way. We're going to get them all. And they all know it. Why? Because Jesus is more powerful than Lucifer ever was, much less now. Boy, got that out, didn't I, Lord? Let's move on. <laughs> it says, he then descended, he that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill or fulfill all things. That was already uh, predestined to happen. 
11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Do you see how that goes together? He goes to hell, takes the keys of death and hell from uh, Lucifer, and then he comes back and he gives us the fivefold ministry. He paid a price to give us the fivefold ministry. And you churches out there better pay attention because you're going to stand before the one that paid the price for a fivefold ministry. And if you're not moving in this fivefold ministry, you need to start. And then he says, for the perfect, this is what the fivefold ministry is for, for the perfecting or equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Okay. He equips the saints, work for the ministry, for the edifying body of Christ. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And that's what we were doing when we were assaulting that demonic spirit. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Well, I'd like to see that. I don't know if I will in my lifetime. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a equipped or perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let me tell you something. If you want to find out if you uh, measure up to the stature of the fullness of Christ, get a deliverance ministry. Because you'll talk to someone to tell you, the demon to tell you, Lucifer's stronger than, than God. Okay. And then when you find out and you, you, you battle with that spirit and he eventually goes, guess who's stronger than who? And it's through that deliverance ministry that you do it, and it was a gift, and it's, it's, uh, it's an apostolic gift. And then you'll know. You've measured up to the stature of the fullness of Christ. That whole team I was with, every one of us measured up to the stature of the fullness of Christ. The reason I can say that is because it was Christ that cast him out. And we just brought Jesus in the picture. That demon's gone. He's, he's rotten in hell fire somewhere or something. I don't know wherever Jesus sends him. That's the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? Because if Jesus would have been there personally, he'd have spoke to that demon. So you think you're more powerful than me? Come out. Shut up and come out. See? So that's the test. This is the revelation, by the way. This is the mystery of God. The test, if you measure it up to the stature of uh, of Christ is that are you going to do everything he did? And he cast out demons. More than one third of his ministry was casting out demons. And you pastors out there, if you're not casting out demons, as far as I'm concerned, you're all walking on shaky ground. You're not even close to the stature of the fullness of Christ. He says, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to, to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. See, these churches that don't have a deliverance ministry, they're being tossed to, back and forth with every wind of doctrine. A wind of doctrine is that, oh, we don't need deliverance. We, you know, we're beyond that or whatever. And, you know, whatever excuses they make, they don't realize they received that from the kingdom of darkness. They received it from those kind of demons that believe, I guess he believes it, that Lucifer is stronger than Christ. He wrote it out for me. Big letters. I mean, you didn't have enough paper to get the way he was like, Lucifer. <laughs> oh, man. Then it says, um, but speaking the truth in love. That's what I'm doing. I'm speaking the truth, and I'm trying to do it in love, even though I have problems with churches that uh, aren't really stepping up to that stature uh, the fullness of Christ. By the, uh, let's see, doing it in love, where are we at here? By speaking the truth in love, may grow up. Look at that, may grow up. Boy, church, you want to grow up? Get you a deliverance ministry. <laughs> You're growing up to the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then it says, uh, grow up into him in all things, not just some things, oh, we're, we really do this good. Oh, no, you're supposed to be doing it all. You know, if, you, if you're a, a, a pretty rich church and feed the hungry, do it. But don't do that only. Then it says, which is the head, Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body fits jointly together. Remember we talked about the church at uh, Manchester, the church at Montego, whatever. That's the whole body fitting together and compact. The compact is like hitting... Uh, Raw steel, you compact, you hit it with a hammer to make it stronger. So that you become stronger, that's what it says. Uh, compacted by that which every joint supplieth. When we had the deliverance team, I couldn't have done that alone. Oh, I could have wrestled with him and I'd have eventually got him out. But you know, I need somebody reading scripture while I'm talking to that guy. And they read scripture and that guy heard the scripture too. And he knows the devils believe and tremble. It says, according to the effectual workings of the measure of every part, that's all of us together, maketh increase 
of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You want to really show love? Get a deliverance ministry. Because there's people out there that got big demons in them, and they're going to try to tell you that a Lucifer is stronger than Jesus, and you can laugh at them too. Because that's what I do. So, Well, that's my share. It's a little long, but uh, who's next? better hear me. I got a lot to say. Maybe a few words, but the message is big. Well, first of all, I thank you for your time. And I'm going to share something out of my daily devotion. It's by Sarah Young called Jesus Calling. It's been marvelous to have a really good friend of mine had blessed me with this. And I truly, every day, it's just a message to my own heart. And they're speaking on, uh, this is uh, the devotion from the other day, uh, and it reads from Psalms 46.10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will exalt, be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And the reading for that says, Take time to be still in my presence. The more hassle you feel, can anybody relate to that part so far? The more you need this sacred space of communion with me. Breathe slowly and deeply. Pause. Pause at your time of your greatest hassle in life. If it's 50 times a day, do that pause and re-grab that peace. Relax in my holy presence while my face shines upon you. This is how you receive my peace, which I always pro-offer to you. Imagine the pain I feel when my children tie themselves up in anxious knots, ignoring my peace of my gift of peace. I read that, and I just wanted to cry because it just brought it to my heart that God has this peace that we're just ignoring. Instead of grabbing onto the peace that he promises us, we grab onto what the world's throwing at us, and we sink in it. It goes on and says, I died a criminal's death. To secure this blessing for you. I read that and I could see him on the cross. And thinking about all that he died died for me. And all he did. And what he went through for me. So that I could have the peace that I was throwing away. Because I had not learned how to receive it. Receive it gratefully. Hide it in your heart. My peace is an inner treasure growing within you as you trust me. Therefore, circumstances cannot touch it. Be still, enjoy peace in my presence. So I ask you, where is the peace of God in you? This is a gift from God for those who will receive it or take it. Jesus says, here, here is my peace I give unto you. This is what I died for, receive it. Hide it in your heart. Deep, deep inside you, so that Satan cannot steal it or take it from you. For he steal your to steal your peace, your joy, your love, your happiness. For those are the words that he goes about. For he goes about the world seeking who he can devour. 
destroying all this because that's your strength. He knows that's what you used to battle him and his kingdom. Where is this peace? Where, where is God's peace in your life? There is no worry, anxiety, stress, anger, bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness, revenge, or jealousy where there is God's peace. These are all sins that you need to, and I, as I deal with it myself, we need to offer these back up to God and repent and take back or take for the first time for many the peace that God has waiting for us, for you, for me. So I leave you with a question. Where is God's gift of peace in your life? Have you received it? Have you received the gift of peace from God yet? Or is it still waiting in his hands? Thank you. Well, I didn't have anything to share at first and asked the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> short notice, but I need something to share. This was a short sermon I was working on, but he said, share what you've got. <clears throat> I titled it, What in the World Are You Afraid Of? Satan is a big bully who goes around beating up on Christians most more than the people of the world that aren't Christians, that don't believe. And he pushes you around, causing bodily harm and scares you into making him lord over your life through fear. Fear is one of his biggest tactics. He doesn't care about you only to make you his slave and trophy against God. The tactic most used is fear. He causes you to worry about your finances, your health, your family, different things like that and more. What are you afraid of? The tact, um, he wants you to submit to him through fear. That way he has control over you and your life. Only to destroy it, like it says in 2 Timothy 1.7. Satan knows when we are weak in certain areas in our lives. And he wants, he waits looking for this weakness to appear, then he attacks. He's always waiting. Satan also will set the scene of circumstances or situations to bring about this weakness through worry, doubt, fear, anxiety, trauma. Because he uses our mind, will, and emotions against us to speak his deceptive lies into our minds to get us to think, act, and believe what we hear and affects our will to choose to believe and agree on his lie through our emotions and fall into play based upon the lie he's spoken and the whole time Satan's using your submission to his tactic of lies to defeat and destroy you and your life and those around you, mostly your family. And that the scripture to back that up is found in John 10.10. 10. Satan only has the power over us as believers in God and sons and daughters of God when we submit to him in this way. And when we do, we are given him all legal rights and ground to hit us with sickness, diseases, in our finances, whatever the situation or circumstance may be. This is why we have to keep 
ourselves in the Word of God. Ask God when you read your scriptures. Ask God for the wisdom, the understanding, and the knowledge to understand his word, the secret treasures of every scripture that he has given to be printed out for us. If we don't do this, we miss out on the real meaning of his word. Therefore, how can we stand against Satan and come against him and stand strong and firm knowing we've got the victory? He's a defeated foe. He has no legal rights to us anymore. And he cannot do what we stand up against him and tell him he can't do. Just like with my scoliosis. That stinking, filthy spirit of scoliosis has been trying to attack me heavy for three days now. And it's been him alone because I recognize it because I never had that kind of attack before normally over 40-some years. And he thinks that he can scare me into submitting to his way and letting him have full ground out of fear of what he might do. Well, you know what, devil? I don't care what you do because you're coming out. You're not staying in this body. You've wreaked havoc on me for 40-some years. I'm done with him. And he is coming out. And I made a declaration today to him. You are coming out. Your time is up. No more. Because... God gave us that right to do that. And that's why we have to get in the scriptures and seek the deep part of God's scriptures. It's all in there. And it's in plain black and white. But we've got to have his understanding and knowledge of the scriptures to see it. That's why there's hidden treasures in it. Not everybody will see it. But if you seek God and ask him for it, he will open the understanding so easily to you. And when you do... It's like a whole new world opened up to you, and it will lift you up. It'll make you stronger, and it'll make you to where you can stand right in front of the devil, and like Terry did, laugh in his face, because you know he has no power over you. There'll be more when I finish this. Bring it on. <laughs> well, that was good right there. We could sit down right there and be... Amen, amen. Well, I appreciate what's been shared so far. That's awesome. I'm going to, uh, I wasn't going to do this originally, but I'm going to piggyback off of uh, Sister Doris there. Go back to uh, Psalms 46. This kind of will lead into just what I wanted to share this morning. Now, starting with verse 10 uh, of Psalm 46, that's what we're used to hearing. Have you ever noticed in the traditions of the church, there's favorite verses and basically what they do is they glean off the um, most pleasant part of a scripture, and that's the one that we, we look at or whatever. And I'm, that's no, uh, um, I want to say that's nothing to Sister Dora. She was using that as part of her thing. But I, it, when I, w I always, when we see scripture, I always go back and just look into context because so many people in the world say the Bible is full of contradictions. It's not. You just don't look at context. So. Anyway, and, and so we look at 10, and my favorite part, be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That's awesome. But go back to verse 1. The context of what we're looking at, and this is the part that in so many things in Scripture nobody wants to look at, he's laying out reality for us before he says that. Let's look at uh, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Amen for that. There will, be, there will not be fear, even though the earth be removed. How many sinkholes have we seen reported in the world, right? Uh, erosions, uh, uh, landslides, uh, forest fires, right? The earth being removed. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, there you go. We've seen that where everything's in the hurricane, just wash, houses wash right off into the sea. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there's the earthquakes we've been hearing about, just all kinds of calamity. God always brings it around to something better. There is a river whose streams shall make glad in the city of God. 
The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. This is one of them right here, Mountain of God Tabernacle. Amen. God is in the midst of her and shall not be moved. So no matter what else happens with this, you're with God. You don't got to worry about that. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. Who's got the power? Hmm? The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. But <laughs> he makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. And then we go to our favorite part about be still and know that I'm God. So if you look at that whole context, basically he's just given it to you straight right there. There's going to be all kinds of problems, just like I said there would be, just like my prophet said there would be, just like Revelation. However, if you're in my kingdom serving me and you're one of my servants and you're in apostolic ministry, he's going to bring you through it. So that's a little addendum to what I was going to talk about this morning. Um, social media is an interesting place. And when I, you know, I, I've only really probably been in it four or five years, something like that. You know, got, got into where regular on Facebook and, you know, those kind of things. And I often wondered, you know, because depending on the diversity of the friends that you have, and you should have a diversity of friends um, because your influence increases if you do. Um, I have friends that I've worked with and even mentioned in sermons here before that are extremely talented musicians, more than I would ever be. Um, and, you know, gifted people of all kinds. What some of them has in common is that they're just atheists. Um, and so if I see a post of theirs uh, or, or, or they're commenting, you know, how if you, they comment on something, it shows up. Um, so, you know, in a lot of these, their world, they're totally surrounded with people that are atheists, with people that have uninformed spiritual opinions. And, you know, at, at first you think, uh, why would you waste your time commenting on some of these things? But, you know, I'd, I'd say over the last year or so, I realize God's giving me an opportunity. Now... I'll take a lot of flack if I do comment, and the reason is I'm shining a light into darkness. So, you know, and it, it doesn't take long for some people if they can't make an intellectual argument, if they don't have anything to really base their opinion on, you know, then it's the junior, I call it the junior high route. They'll say something stupid or vulgar or insulting, and, you know, the whole idea is let's take the the focus off the fact that I don't have any reason or fact now that you've presented me with some kind of fact or basis, you know, and those kind of things. And so you have to be kind when that happens. But it's been interesting because I realize they're not going to go to church. They're not going to listen to ministry on radio or uh, internet or, you know, television or, or whatever. And so as long as I do it in love and then do it respectfully, which I always do, but it's interesting because I had one the other day and, and when uh, Terry was reading out of Ephesians, it was interesting because one of the comments was, you know, um, the Bible is not, uh, you know, nobody even knows who wrote the Bible and, you know, and it's word of man. You know, we've, we've all dealt with that or whatever. So I commented back to say, I'm, I'm, cur I'm curious or puzzled why you would say that. I said, it's generally accepted that about two-thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul. So you saying we don't know who wrote it. And I just saw an example in Ephesians 3 that says, I, Paul, am writing this. It's like, okay, well, is there any any mystery he just said i'm the one doing this i said names of the chapters so many bear the name <laughs> of the person that wrote it i i thought that's you know strange and i and i then i you know kindly say i hear this you know the bible's you know has contradictions or conflicting i hear this from people who don't study the bible so i'm 
I'm not really sure what you're basing it on. And I said, over a lifetime of study, when I look at cultural uh, context, when I look at historical context, uh, I look at customs of the time, um, the language it was uh, translated from, I said, when you put them all together, there really aren't these conflicts that you think. I said, that's the problem unless you no have a relationship where you know God and you get help from the Holy Spirit, you may not be able to connect all the dots or put the puzzle pieces together because you don't have a basis by which to do it. And I said, besides, if you can just write the whole thing off, then you, don't, you think that you don't have accountability. So that's the reason to write it off because if I can just write it off, then anything that's in it, I don't have to, I don't have to meet that standard. It'd be nice if you could play the game that way, but you really can't. And so uh, I've just realized, you know, I'm, go ahead and wade into that uh, on these social media posts because I may be the only uh, scripture they're going to hear, the only context, you know, of course. Um, and I noticed that as long as you keep it civil, factual, and make good points, eventually they'll just have to get emotional because there really is no argument back. They're, they don't have ammunition to come back at what you're saying. Um and I'll finish with this. The one I found the most interesting is got into a little bit with a couple people that are doing the evolution thing, you know. And, uh, and of course, if you ever want to you know, ruin the day of somebody like that, you have to remind them because all of us have had science of some kind in school. The only way that you have science is when you have a repeatable event, a repeatable process by which you can formulate the same result. That's what science is. So if somebody believes in the Big Bang, why? You have no proof that it happened. It's not a repeatable event. And I always like to say, order does not come out of chaos. You show me anything on this planet that's in chaos, it doesn't magically come into order. Right? Um, back in the old days, uh, when I went to junior high, they were still teaching printing the old printing presses, and I don't know if any of you remember that, but each little thing had like an E had its own little thing. You stuck it in this type case, and then A had its thing. And so it's very tedious, the old way that he used to have to print, but I think they did that so we had a basis. So if I want to write a paragraph, you want to talk about, you know, a hard time putting that in there, and then it was in the type case, and then you had to put the ink across the thing, and then you had to load the thing down, and... You know, so I feel for Gutenberg that invented that thing, you know. And then you had to put all the type back in the right thing because you don't want, the E has to be at the E's because if you have what they call a dirty type case, it's going to be harder for whoever used it after you. And so I always used that um, back in junior high when that evolution versus creation was going on. We had an assignment. Of course, I was on the creation team and our brainiest guy in the class was on the evolution team. And, you know, they, they can always come at you be, since so much of what we have is faith, uh, has to be revelation, you know, believing, uh, calling things that are not as though they are, you know, the scripture, those things. So it's easy to say, well, you know, if he's not here and I can't see it, he doesn't exist. And I said, really? Okay, so you don't believe in the wind then? And, he, and they're like, well, no, I can feel the wind. I said, well, how do you know? Okay, well, it's, it's all based on your senses. I mean, I get that, but I said, so you don't think there's anything out there beyond the realm of our senses that exists then? What's ultraviolet light? We can't see that, right? And so, so anyway, you know, you do that kind of thing. And this is the, the basis by which I, I just am nice, but I'm scientific. And the one that I always got when people would tell me, you know, they believe in evolution, I say, okay, well, if... You're telling me that man evolved from apes, right? not they, they evolved from primates, right? And they say, yeah. I say, okay, well, we still have apes, and we have fully developed men. So if you're telling me there was a process by which we developed, where are they? Right? Of course, they, and then this guy says, well, just look in the museum. I said, no, I'm not talking about history. I'm talking about now. I said, the beginning is still here. The end is here. You know, they think, we, they think we'll evolve onto something else, but I'm saying, where is the in-between? In nature, there's the in-between is living in most species except for man, right? So anyway, and of course, all they can do then is, oh, well, you know, we know science, and, you know, that's why your 
I'm a pathetic whatever because, you know, I just can't have the faith to believe science. Imagine that. So anyway, so what I usually do when I was telling you about that type case uh, when printing is, I always leave them with the fact that chaos does not, or, uh, can, order cannot come out of chaos. And if you use the example of that type case, right? So if I put my type case or several type cases in a room, and with my special forces background, I put C4 under it, right? And I wire it and I blow it up, right? What's the chances that I would come out with a perfectly printed Webster's Dictionary? So you're trying to tell me in the beginning that an explosion happened and now we have extreme order. We have people now that have the intellect to discuss back and forth these things. And so you're, you, the person who has to have faith is the person who would believe in that. I mean, that's faith right there that, yeah, somehow, you know, and I said, even make it even easier than that. Let's take about two dozen blocks like we played with when we were a kid, right? And they, they have letters, right? And so we can spell out something, you know, a paragraph or half a paragraph, put it all in, a, in, a, in a, one of those big laundry baskets, right? Throw it around, and then I throw it against the wall, and then it's going to come out perfectly lined up in my paragraph, right? Now, you know, if I did that a million times, how close would, would it happen? Just random. Well, I don't know. Maybe, would it ever come out right if we just kept doing it? I'm not sure. But the chances is, is remotely ridiculous. And so that's what I try and be, uh, be thoughtful and to be respectful. But I guess what I'm saying this morning is we cannot be afraid to take on these things in the realms where we're going to receive criticism. Because the Bible says, Jesus says, they hated me, they're going to hate you. And so I guess what I'm encouraging, you know, matter how the odds are against you, where you go, or how unpleasant it will be, or, you know, what's going to be said, because, you know, basically whatever they're saying back, you know the origin of that, don't you? I mean, once light is shown in the darkness and you trap these things in a corner, right, they don't even know what's on them. And I usually leave them with this, and I'll leave you with this as well. It is the height of arrogance to think that all the knowledge that we can acquire from the day where we're born to the day we pass from this earth that could possibly be collected from our limited senses, our six senses, right? that we could possibly be able to determine on our own the totality of the universe and the whole concept of God. How arrogant can we be that you can make the declaration there is no God based on your finite life, your finite intellect, and your finite senses? Because if you study science at all, you know there's sounds beyond the realm of what we can hear. So do those sounds exist or don't they? Right, with the Hubble telescope looking into the universe now, they're finding more things all the time. You're trying to tell me that you are the total sum of knowledge and that you can determine whether there's a God, how powerful he is, and whether he really saves or exists. You can do all that from your finite thing. So, no, you can't. So, just encourage you when you get these things, but be kind, because they won't be, and you need to make sure that you are. So, Brother Carl. Amen. God is good. All the time, God is good. You know, the Lord has been sharing with me for the last couple of months, probably a year or two, specifically about speaking life, the Word of God, the Word of God. But I'm going to approach it from a different angle. Um, turn with me to John chapter 6, verse 63. John chapter 6, verse 63. And Jesus is speaking here. It says, it is the spirit that quickeneth or makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you 
They are spirit and they are life. Now, what's interesting is the word here in the Greek is rhema. Now, I, I, because I, I want to draw, he's been dealing with me about um, understanding the difference between rhema and lagos, but yet seeing them as one power, one entity, one life, one Christ. So I want to say this again, because what's said of he, it's said also of us. I'm going to bring this out again. It says, let me read this again. It is the spirit that quickeneth or makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words, the rhema that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now notice, he himself is the logos. So he is saying the words that is spoken from the logos, me, myself, the spoken word, the rhema, is spirit, and they are life. He has been dealing with me about, Carl, are you speaking life? Now, here's what's interesting. We can't speak life unless we are thinking life. Now, let me go into that. The Greek understanding of the logos, there was an invisible and a visible concept. So the word logos itself, which is word, the word itself had, has an invisible side and a visible side. The word logos as a fault is still the word. What you think is still the word, whether it is for good or for bad. So he's been reminding me, Carl, even in your thinking of the logos, doesn't become the tangible until it is spoken. So a lot of times when we speak what we say, we are, I, I've spoken to that situation, I've spoken life, but I don't see anything happening. It's because we're not, it's not happening in here with the logos that's inside of us. So he's been reminding me, Carl, if you are thinking of life, the spoken word, when you speak the spoken word, it will be life. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more. So, but he's been dealing with me about, Carl, what you think is what you get. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I guarantee you, whatever situation we are addressing or facing, before we even address or face the situation, if it is not already conquered in our heart by the word, the logos inside of ourselves, then it can be accomplished or focused, you know, out there. Now, let me, let me bring this now into our realm and everything. Turn with me to John 17, 17. Because you've heard what Jesus, um, we just went over what Jesus himself said about the words that he himself speaks spirit and life because there's a lot of words that are being spoken are spirit and death but we are to speak spirit and life and if you are thinking life what you speak will be life but if you are thinking well I don't think this is going to work I don't know here we go again and then you get up and try to speak life you're not going to get the result because the result must first be manifest in your own heart and in your own mind before there's a manifestation, a tangible manifestation out there in your real world. And let's look at this, um, John 17, 17. And I'm not going to take too much longer. Now it says here, John chapter 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy, and this is the prayer of Jesus to his father. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now listen to this. Truth, a better translation, because when I hear the word truth, I think of knowledge. What's right and what's wrong. But in the Greek, this truth means reality. The reality of what? The reality of Christ. The reality of what? The reality of an entire kingdom. The reality of what? the reality of the kingdom of Christ and of his kingdom that dwells within you. See, there's an, see, there's an alternate 
reality and there's an ultimate reality. A lot of times we dwell in an alternate reality because we are carried away by, and it was just by every wind of doctrine. But when you have the word within you, you can speak from an ultimate reality, which is the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God. So let's look at this. Um, so again, verse 17, um, sanctify them through thy truth. Sanctify means to what? Set apart, to set aside for a specific use. So sanctify them through thy truth or through thy reality. Thy word is our reality. Thy word, his word is our reality. Now, I'm going to keep reading for that because we're going to see, I, I, you, know, you, know, you know, he has been showing me not only the concept of the word, but the reality of the word and the reality of who he is in us and who we are in him. And that being one, you know, what someone asked me two weeks ago, um, you know, uh, John 15, to abide in him. And they said, Carl, what does it mean to you to abide? I said, well, to me, it simply means to abide means to be whole. And to be whole means to become. What we be whole or abide in, we become. So, if the Logos is in my head, if the invisible Logos, the unspoken word, which is the invisible Logos, because I'm thinking about this thing, doesn't become visible or tangible until it's spoken out, if that's in my head, you better believe I, I will become what's on the inside of me. I will become. So, let me continue to read this, because I want us to see what he's been dealing with me about is the um, tangibility of the kingdom of God being at hand but the tangibility of who we are in him and who he is in us, that we may grow up into the fullness. Someone just read that in Ephesians, that we may grow up into the fullness of Christ. Let's read. Let's, let's see how that's done practically. Um, so it says here, I'm um, in verse um, 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also myself, oh, sent them into the world. That one statement is a series of sermons. Okay, and for their sake I sanctify, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through thy word. Which word? The spoken lagas. The spoken lagas. Neither pray I for these also, but for them also which shall believe, now get this, on me through their word. Now that's funny. So Jesus is saying, they're going to believe on me through the word that's spoken by us. That word again is Lagos. In the beginning was the word, the Lagos. Do, you, do we realize that when we speak the word, we are literally speaking Christ in the midst of that situation himself? So when we speak, uh, when we speak the Lagos, man, know that you are speaking the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. You are speaking life in that situation. To keep on speaking the word and a life in that situation. Now, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, turn with me to, um, um, turn with me. Wait, there's one more verse that I think I should probably go over. Let's, let's look at it um, in, that, in that same passage. Um, 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one. Now, I love this next phrase. Even as we are one. That's powerful. He says that, that they, we, may be one. Even as we are one. I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now, my last verse, and this is, this is one of my um, verses, because you know, I still have memory verses, just like I did when I was a kid. <laughs> I still have memory verses that I quote and I go back and forth and everything. But turn with me to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, uh, verse 11. And we all know this verse. We all know this verse. But there are some things that I want to um, point out that he just showed me about this. 
Isaiah chapter 11, I mean, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. And it says here, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, let's look at that verse closely. So shall my word be the word of God again. Now, that word be literally means alive. It means it is an active living reality based upon the truth of the word of God, based upon the reality of the kingdom of God, which we've just looked at. So when he says, so shall my word be, that, that when he spoke at the beginning and, and said, in the beginning, God created, he spoke. The word that we speak itself will be alive in the very thing that we speak it into existence. So, he, so he's saying, so shall my word be alive. Don't forget the word believe means be alive it, it, it's from an old um, anglo um, saxon word be means alive leave means according to pattern type or person that's why when you hear a very practical example when you hear um he believes in those bears or whatever gang you, you can tell when someone believes in those bears or tigers or whatever because if you look in their car they have surrounded their life with that thing that they believed in. They've got their cups. They've got their plates. They wear their jackets. They, the thing that they believed in has consumed them. So when someone says, man, that guy really believes in those bears or the tigers or the titans, you better believe they've got the blankets. They've got everything in their house, in their car. They believe into the reality of who that team is. So, with, so for us to believe into the Lord Jesus Christ, we literally take on every aspect of who he is, and we begin to walk and act and think like him. So when folks say, well, I'm a believer in Christ, do they really believe in Christ? Are they really alive into the person of Christ himself? And is that person alive into the, um, um, them, their own selves? So, as we, I'm going to bring this to a close. So as we begin, so the Lord has just been dealing with me plainly. Carl, man, you know, the entire kingdom is within you. Speak that word, think that word, feel that word, live that word. And I won't go into this now, but that word believe has four concepts for that reality of the kingdom to manifest into your life, into the things that we're facing and the first concept, to believe means to see. To believe means to feel. To believe means to know. To believe means to expect. Those realities, those are four branches that flows out of the life of believing that must line up in our personal life that when we truly do believe something, it will come into creation. Amen? That's what the Lord has been sharing with me about it. even this morning all week all month he's been sharing with me carl are you speaking life are you speaking my kingdom into your existence personal corporately financially it's like yes father continue to teach me so let's bow our heads in prayer oh, father we thank you for this um, time lord i thank you for the witness and the testimony of the power of the word spoken by everyone here this morning Father, it is so rich. Everybody has specific jewels in their inheritance. And that we could stand up here and just share a jewel out of the treasures of our kingdom that you've given us. Father, we are so richly blessed. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, be with our hearts and our minds. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining our live broadcast here from the Mount of God Tabernacle. We hope to see you soon, and may you have a blessed day in the Lord Jesus Christ.